Welcome back, everybody. Next up, I'm joined by Stuart Heggie of Scottish Mortgage to discuss what has been a truly remarkable performance by what is by far the UK's largest investment trust. He'll be followed by Ladislas Paskiewicz from Total, the energy giant which is spearheading the transformation of the energy landscape as we enter the Green Revolution. Here are the presentations. So these gentlemen are a couple of quotes to get us started. And whilst you're reading those, I would just like to thank you for taking the time to join me for the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust presentation this year, uh, doing this from home. And I'm currently trying to toggle between two different screens. So I, ho I hope I get this right. Uh, my name is Stuart Heggie, and I work as an investment specialist alongside the joint managers, James Anderson and Tom Slater. Now, those quotes that you've just read were placed quite deliberately to serve as a mental chicane. The first was by the father of value investing, Ben Graham, and it appeared in his 1949 publication, The Intelligent Investor. Now, the second quote comes from Einstein, and he made this observation following the solar eclipse in 1919 that validated his theory of general relativity. And the point to all of this is to position Scottish mortgage. We are much more philosophically aligned to Einstein's power of imagination, where it's far more important to focus on what might happen rather than Graham's world, where anticipated growth is regarded as being somehow risky or dangerous. Now, to the title of the presentation, Access to Future Growth. What do we mean by growth? And what role do we play as investors in accessing it? Well, Growth, put simply, is the inherently optimistic belief that society will achieve more tomorrow than it does today. And then to our role as investors, we try to provide our shareholders with long-term with long growth at a low cost. And we do this by providing capital to companies so that they can grow. So at Scottish Mortgage, we are optimistic and we invest in transformational growth companies that address big opportunities and possess a competitive advantage that could play out over many years. So today I'd like to share with you how important it is to be optimistic, some of the lessons that we've learned in recent years and where we think we'll find growth for the decade ahead. And firstly, we think carefully about the dynamic shown in this chart, which is perhaps the most overlooked one in the world of equity investing. It's based on the work of a Swedish professor uh, called Henrik Bessenbinder. And the reason that it's so important is that it shows us that a very small number of big winners drive all of the equity market returns. So just to explain what we have here, this data set is for global equities and it's between 1990 and 2018. And that is some 61,100 companies. And when you rank them by return, you find that 61% of them have destroyed value you need another 38% of them to make up for that value destruction. And, and just 1.3% or 811 companies have driven the $45 trillion of net value that has been created over that time period. This is hugely important. And that pattern holds true over any time period over the last 90 years. So as investors, we need to give ourselves the best possible chance of finding those outliers, the companies that are addressing the really big opportunities. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we spend a lot of time imagining what can go right, rather than doing the easy bit, which is to talk about what can go wrong. And core to the way that we research companies is built around a 10 question framework. And that brings in consideration the overall market opportunity, the competitive advantage that a company possesses, the management attitudes, the financial strengths and the valuation. Is, this, is there the potential to make a multiple of our investment over the long term from here? And the image that you see in front of you right now 
shows the absolute performance of the stocks in the portfolio over the last 10 years. So working from the left-hand side, the scale goes from minus 100. So that is losing all 100% that you've invested in a stock. And we actually start with the, with the acceptance that you know, that could happen and we get some wrong. So plus 100 is doubling your money, plus 200 is tripling your money, and so on. And, and, what we, and what we hope is apparent from this image is the importance of the extreme payoffs that a small number of big winners provide. So we view the mistake of missing out on one of these big winners as being much more serious than the mistake of buying a few stocks that have gone wrong. So with an optimistic outlook, what we're really thinking about here are probability adjusted payoffs, or in very simple terms, if there was a 75% chance that we lose 100% in one stock, it goes to zero. And there's a 25% chance of a stock going up by say 20 times, we would buy that stock every single time. And this is the dominant force behind our portfolio construction. We pay no attention whatsoever to geographic or sector allocations. This is a high conviction, bottom up stock picking portfolio with a low turnover. And we will invest the most of our capital in those companies that we believe have got the largest upside from here. And that is why in a portfolio of around 80 companies, around 80% of the allocation is actually held in the top 30 stocks. Indeed, often about half of the total allocation is held in the top 10. So our approach is based around thinking, what if? So it's spending time um, imagining where a company's culture might take it, as opposed to the, the what is on the Ben Graham side, building models based on uh, existing revenue streams. And when you look at the top performers here, which are shown in the box on the top left-hand side, key to capturing this growth has been a patient and long-term view. We, we currently live in a world where the average holding period of a stock is, is, is less than two years. Our investment horizon is, is over five years and beyond because it's over that time frame that business fundamentals really start to play out and management teams start to bed in their plans and we see what's coming through. And currently, uh, over two thirds of the portfolio by weight has been held for five years or more. But to capture these extreme returns that we see here, um, we have to view volatility not as a risk, but as an opportunity. And that's because no stock goes up in a straight line. <laughs> In fact, some of them have made us look quite silly on occasion. And the chart that you now see here shows our best performing stocks over the last decade and the maximum drawdowns that we have experienced in a 12 month period. Now you can see that, that most of them have fallen by a third and uh, some of them actually by about 50%. And our, the largest holding that we have in the portfolio today, Tesla is, is shown on the left hand side now, we first bought this company in January 2013, when the company was worth $7 billion. And it's a really, really good example uh, of the value of endurance because the, the, the fall that you can see there, the, uh, the large one was actually shortly after we bought it. And in fact, it's fallen by 30% or more on 10 occasions since we bought it. So the test during those times is really about turn off the Bloomberg screens, ignore the short-term news, and focused on the long-term prospects uh, of a business. Now, aside from this volatility, um, it's not been an easy company to own Tesla. It has a colorful founder who has attracted the wrong sorts of headlines. It has experienced various different operational setbacks on its journey. And, you know, put simply, a lot of people wanted it to fail. The oil lobbyists hated it. The big automakers either didn't take it seriously or sneered at it. But, to us, this was a company that was misunderstood. And it was addressing a market that's simply vast. There are around 80 million cars sold each year. So if it was you know, at all successful, it could, it, there's not only a huge market for it to go after, but it also could bring huge benefits to society. So these periods of volatility that we see not only pre present us with a wonderful opportunity uh, to buy more shares, but we have found over the years it's, it's been a great opportunity to strengthen relationships with company management teams 
who remember loyalty and support during these difficult times. We, we view ourselves as being actual investors who don't run away just because share price tumbles. Um, instead, we try and help companies support management and encourage them to continue to strive towards their long-term goals. Now, many of the names that you see here, being Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, Zoom, these are big and established companies and they are benefiting from increasing returns to scale. And the, the opportunity that, that lies ahead of them um, remain tremendously exciting. But we, as growth investors, must, to paraphrase Jeff Bezos, in fact, live in the future. And that means seeking out the next Amazon, finding the next Tesla. And the, um, the good news is that there is high competition for capital, and we have a really strong pipeline of new ideas coming through. But the world is changing. And the image that you should now hopefully have on screen um, shows us what's taking place. And it's that companies are choosing to stay private for longer. And this shows up in the data. Now, most of this data actually comes from the United States. There are now half the number of public companies there were 25 years ago. In fact, 1996 was peak IPO, most number of companies coming to the market when there was around 700 of them. Last year, that number was about 100. And the reason for this shift is actually quite fundamental. The simple fact is that online business models mean that companies can grow more rapidly without any need for outside investment. So you used to have to build bricks and mortar stores and hire a sales team in order to sell your goods. But now you can actually just rent a store space on Shopify. You can do your advertising on Instagram or Spotify, and you can take payment via the online payment platform Stripe. And you can do all that by renting a server, by renting server space on AWS. So in effect, you can build a business from the chair that you are sitting in right now. Now, I, I was actually talking uh, to my wife about this um, at breakfast this morning. And she said that I have to um, mention Kylie Jenner and Jenner, Kylie Cosmetics, because I had actually explained to her before that this is a billion dollar company, which as I understand it, many of you will know about. Um, she is one of the Kardashians, but she only has six employees within this business. And it's because she uses all of the tools that I've just described before. But the effect of all of this is that more returns are being made before a company goes public. And that can really be seen in this chart. So you've got Amazon founded 1994. Three years later, it IPO'd on a valuation of $400 million. Whereas Spotify was founded in 2006, it IPO'd 12 years later on a valuation of $27 billion. So public markets are not dead, not by any means, but there's a growing group of business leaders that are no longer in an anxious rush to get there. If you don't require the capital, then why bother? Because you actually have far more freedom as a private company to concentrate on the task in hand, as opposed to thinking about doing quarterly earnings calls. So at Scottish Mortgage, we use our closed ended structure as a benefit and we invest in established private companies and we access this growth prior to IPO. Now, currently we can invest up to 30% of the portfolio at time of purchase in these private companies. Now, our approach to investing in private companies is actually no, no different to the way we do in, in public companies. And that's because these are established businesses and many of them are global names. So to name a few, there, there'd be Airbnb, uh, there'd be SpaceX, uh, uh, there'd be ByteDance, the owners of TikTok, uh, there'd be Ant Group in China, which is now the largest FinTech company in the world. And actually when we invested in that business, it was worth $150 billion. And it would have, in, in FTSE parlance, it would have been the largest company in the FTSE 100. Now, the image that you can see in front of you now shows that a, that a pathway is emerging in Scottish Mortgage, where companies are first being bought in private, and then we hold them through IPO and beyond. So the blue line shows you the percentage amount that's held in private companies. Now it stands at 17%. 
but the yellow line then includes the public companies that were first bought when private. So that is a further 19%. Uh, so the total is 36%. And I suppose there are three observations that I would like to make about investing in private companies. First of all, we are gaining access uh, to additional returns for our shareholders. So to give you three examples, it'd be Alibaba, Spotify, and Meituan Jianping. These are all now large public companies, but in all three occasions, these companies had more than tripled in value by the time the IPO'd. The second point is that we are building stronger relationships with companies. Our timeframes are aligned to the founders, so they're engaging with us on long-term strategic issues. And we're building stronger links with them uh, uh, when they then become public. Uh, a good example would, in fact, be Spotify and their founder, Daniel Ek, who the managers talk quite frequently to. And, and we are learning more about streaming music um, and, and increased use of you know, di uh, digitization and media from him every single time we speak to him. The third point to make is that we're now gaining more opportunities to invest in some of these truly exceptional companies. When investing in private companies, it's often investment banks that bring them round. But most of the investments that we are now making are coming from what we call the direct channel. And what I mean by that is it's companies coming direct to us at Bailey Gifford. We still own every single share um, that, that we bought in our first private company in Alibaba in 2012 and much more besides. And the company appreciate that. Uh, it matters a great deal. And because of that, we were given the opportunity to invest uh, in Ant Group that first started out as being their payments platform, Alipay. Other examples would be, for example, SpaceX. We were given the opportunity to invest in SpaceX, which has a very tight register. And that's come from our long and committed shareholding in Tesla. So. We've seen how important it is to invest in a small number of big winners. And that by investing in private companies, we're able to capture more uh, of the growth. But where might we find some opportunities over the coming years? Well, one point that is very important is where we get our inputs from. And we spend a great deal of time talking to academics who are thinking about the future. Now, one of them is Professor Carlotta Perez of the University of Sussex, and she studies paradigm shifts. And it's really the impact of technological revolutions. And such a revolution is actually taking place right now. And that will be as significant to us as the industrial revolution was to agricultural laborers. Companies are now using the modern tools of technology to create new business models. And in doing so, they're making the incumbent bulk production world completely obsolete. Now, the, the image that you see here is of two delivery hero agents. And the important point is that the, the entire food chain is currently being redesigned. Now that's from the way that it's being produced, but also how it's being consumed. And this represents one of these very large opportunities. Now, delivery hero itself is a company that decided to exit its home market uh, of, of Germany. It had great foresight that it couldn't grow well enough there. In a very short space of time, it's now operating in 40 countries on four continents worldwide. And believe it or not, it currently delivers more meals per day in Kuwait than actually there are people, <laughs> people living there. Now, to pick one of the other stocks, no doubt we're all feeling a bit zoomed out at present, but the way that we work is changing. It was the industrial revolution and the mass production world that dictated that we should all be in the same place at the same time and in the modern equivalent of it is nine till five but nowadays we have a, a knowledge-based economy people want to have more of a say in, in where they work and when they work and companies want to be able to uh, access the best talent and indeed company and indeed companies want to be able to talk to their consumers without necessarily wasting the time of, of, of travel time in getting there and Zoom is the sort of business that facilitates this and is representative of some of the other uh, companies in the portfolio also. Then healthcare. It is changing, particularly where data and artificial intelligence meet healthcare. Illumina is, is a leader in DNA sequencing. If we think about the Human Genome Project some 20 years ago, it took 
billions of dollars um, and a couple of years to map out one human genome. Then the SARS outbreak came around and it then took six months to sequence that particular disease. But when COVID-19 has come around, it was actually mapped out in a small number of weeks. And if we actually think about the benefits of that, as, as we sit here today in, in November, there are already vaccines in place as a result of this. So this matters a great deal. Uh, another place that we are seeing opportunities is in China, which we believe is misunderstood. And for growth investors, it simply cannot be ignored. Many people see China as being a factory of the world, government controlled, or that the US somehow um, hold, hold the keys to its, its success. But when people make these broad generalizations, they miss out on big opportunities. In the United States, there are 10 cities with a population in excess of 1 million. In China, there are 112. China has seen a 50-fold rise in its per, per capita GDP over the last 40 years, and hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. And it's now arguably the most vibrant center of innovation anywhere on the globe. And what's really quite exciting is that the consumer consumption story has barely even got started there. Uh, in the United States, as, as a share of GDP, um, uh, consumer consumption is 70%. In India, it's 60%. In China, it's only 40, and that's gone from 30 to 40 in the last decade, and it's picking up pace. And we are now meeting companies that, that are growing up in this ferociously competitive environment where the rewards are simply huge. Meituan Jianping would be a good example. Um, they, uh, they're listed at the bottom of the screen. They are an online delivery platform and uh, they, they became essential, an essential lifeline during the pandemic. Now to give you some idea of scale, Grubhub are the largest equivalent in the US and they deliver 500,000 meals per day. Meituan Jianping delivers 30 million meals a day and it is increasing. They're now doing an additional 10 million grocery deliveries a day due to the due to the, um, the logistical workforce that they have set out. And then on the supply side, it's quite interesting because higher grade restaurants are choosing to have their meals delivered. And also home delivery is becoming a route to get the freshest food. Believe it or not, there are homes in China now being built without kitchens. And we, we met with the founder uh, this summer and uh, we're quite entertained by uh, what he said, there are now 800 million people living in an urban environment in China and they are eating, eating three meals per day. So whilst 30 million might feel like a lot, we feel as though there's plenty of room to grow. Now also mentioned on this screen is Ant Group. They currently pro uh, process a multiple of the number of transactions that Visa do per day, but they're also using artificial intelligence to replace human judgment in financial services. So just by using your smartphone, you can borrow, you can save, you can insure, and you can actually run your entire small business finances. And this is a company that is growing at a ferocious rate. Now, the next area that we think that we're going to find opportunities over the, over the coming years, um, I, I put recognizing deep transitions here, it's really in, in terms of energy change. So Scottish Mortgage started in 1909, and it might have been one of these people that you see on the vehicle um, that, that might have been its first investors. Since then, fossil fuels have helped create a huge expansion over the last century, but a major shift is taking place. And those days are starting to come to an end. Earlier this year, we saw that fossil fuels cost more to take out of the ground than people were actually willing to pay for them. Some pointed to the uh, the pandemic has been the reason, but actually it came before that. And it's because the cost of solar power is decreasing at a faster rate than most thought possible. Many had assumed that the, de uh, the, that the declines were by about 10 to 15% per year. In fact, it's closer to 30%. And there are also some huge improvements being made in battery and storage power. In the UK now, close to half of our el electricity has been generated by renewable sources. And in Germany, it's 56% and rising. So to date, the main investments that we've had in this theme have been focused on electric vehicles. So that's such as Tesla or NIO in China or Aurora, which is focused on providing uh, autonomous driving technology to other vehicle manufacturers. 
But this energy generation change will have a dramatic impact on the way that we live our lives and present us with huge and long running growth opportunity. And we're now making some new investments in that area. Um, one good example would be a private company called Northvolt, a Swedish battery maker. Now, batteries are key enablers of change. We've seen Tesla and other car manufacturers continually point to battery capacity as the biggest bottleneck for the growth in electric vehicles. And uh, Northvolt has a really quite a favorable starting point. It has a team of top battery chemists. It's led by a commercially minded ex-Tesla CEO, and it has a fantastic cost advantage as the first, as its first plant is actually near cheap hydropower in Swedish Lapland. And on top of, and on top of that, um, it has important commitments already from the large European car manufacturers. Now, this energy revolution has a long way to go, and it will go beyond electric vehicles and battery technology, and it's extremely high up on our research agenda. Now, just to conclude, at Scottish Mortgage, we take a resolutely optimistic approach to investing. We build a high conviction portfolio that's made up of both public and private companies. We invest over the long term with an investment horizon of over five years. And finally, costs matter a great deal. So we offer this at a low cost. It's currently 0.36%, which is unmatched anywhere when you take into consideration the normal costs of investing in private companies. I'd just like to think, uh, finish by saying thank you for your time. Please do come and uh, please do come and visit us, and we wish you all well. And uh, if we if we don't see you over the next day or so, we hope, we hope to see you in person next year. Thank you.